out of this. My name is Sammy Coombs, and I lead the go-to-market strategy for over 10,000 of our Modern Work partners across Australia and New Zealand. Uh, for the visually impaired, I have fair skin, brown hair, blue eyes, I'm wearing a denim shirt, black pants, and very white sneakers. <laughs> uh, and my pronouns are she and her. Um, to kick us off today, though, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in which we stand, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging, and we celebrate and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and community. Now, at Microsoft, our mission is to empower every person and organisation on the planet to achieve more. We truly believe that energised and empowered employees are the key to a durable competitive advantage for every organisation. Uh, as part of our regular work trend index, um, late last year we surveyed over 20,000 individuals across, across 11 countries and we analysed trillions of Microsoft 365 productivity signals along with LinkedIn and Glint labour trends. Now the findings point to three key pivots or urgent pivots I would say for leaders of today. Firstly, we need to end productivity paranoia. Second, we need to recognise that employees come to the office for each other and we need to re-recruit everyone. Now, there's a couple of these that I feel particularly passionate about because I'm literally living them today. Um, I live down in Gerringong, which is, for those of you who don't know, is about two hours south um, on the beautiful south coast of New South Wales. Uh, and my manager and the organisation trust that I can deliver on my work day to day, connect with partners across Australia and New Zealand and still be an effective and productive member of my team no matter where I work. Um, the, you know, I'd say I do travel to the office every couple of weeks for events like this to connect with partners or when I feel like I need that hit of connection with my coworkers or my manager. Um, and personally, I would say I love that I get to live where I live. I get to bring my kids up on the beach, but I also still get to have my dream job at a, at a company like Microsoft. I think we need to recognise that, uh, you know, empowering today's digitally connected and distributed workforce really does require that beautiful mix of the right culture and right technology. And it's, it, it does create, as a result of, you know, that mix, organisations today are facing significant challenges. And it's those challenges that we'll be exploring today. Uh, how can we be sure that we're taking the right measures to secure our devices and our data from cyber attacks while we are working anywhere and everywhere? Uh, I would like to showcase today, or I guess as part of today, we're going to walk you through um, and you're going to hear from experts in this field on how to secure, um, secure your workforce using Windows 11. Uh, and also hear from one of our customers who's gone through the experience of the last couple of months and has deployed Windows 11 in their organisation. First up though, I'd love to introduce you to Andy Malakuti, our ANZ commercial category lead, who's going to walk you through the what and the why of Windows 11. Over to you, Andy. <laughs> Thanks, Sammy. Thank you very much, Sammy. Welcome everyone, for everyone in the room and, and everyone joining us uh, remotely as well. Uh, my name is Andy Malakuti. I'm the commercial category lead for Microsoft here in ANZ. Uh, for the visually impaired, I have brown eyes, olive skin. I'm wearing a blue denim shirt, grey pants, um, and my pronouns are he and him. 
Today I'm very excited to talk to you guys about Windows 11 Pro and how it was built very much for secure hybrid work. Now when we all went home back in March 2020, two things happened at a dramatic rate. The first was remote working became a reality for pretty much all of us. It had to. We were forced to really accelerate that digital transformation and enable us to work remotely. But the second thing that also happened was that, unfortunately, cybercrime and cyber threats increased significantly as a result of the pandemic. Now, if we took a, take a closer look at some of those statistics in the market landscape, we at Microsoft, we've done a bunch of research, uh, both through Terra Nova, we've done our own security signals report, and what we found through some surveys is in a company of 1,000 employees, around 200 of them would click on a phishing link. And of those, 140 individuals would actually download malware potentially compromising um, security data and credentials. And this is just based on a, a survey of 1,000. Now, 70% of surveyed organisations have experienced threat incidents meaning phishing attacks, um, critical issues in their hybrid workplace. This is becoming more and more prevalent and more commonplace. And in Australia, specifically in the last financial year, we've seen $33 billion in losses as a result of cybercrime, um, as, um, as reported by the Australian government's ACSC report. Now, the business landscape has changed a lot. Um, Obviously, in the last few years, let me just make sure I'm on the right slide. Beautiful. Sorry, guys, can we get the last? Yep, thank you. So we've seen the business landscape change quite dramatically in the last few years. Um, one thing we can pretty much be certain of now is hybrid work is here to stay. It's not going away. It's here for forever. And with this comes new business models and new ways of working. And as a result, cyber attacks are actually becoming more prolific as well and more sophisticated. Um, and security is becoming a top priority for a lot of organisations as a result of that. We've got people working in more places, more devices, different technologies, um, and the flexibility that they require um, also dictates the need for greater security to protect those devices, those identities, those applications, that data and so forth. Again, some of the things that we've learned in our security signals report, 60% of surveyed organisations have employees that work from home at least some of the time. I think that figure is increasing daily. Just as a show of hands of the people in the room, who has uh, you know, people working remotely in their organisation? Or should I say, has anyone not got? Exactly. Um, look, three out of four people that we've surveyed say that um, Unfortunately, hybrid work does lead organisations more vulnerable to security threats. And 70% of surveyed security decision makers are worried about the risk of device theft as a result of hybrid workers as well. Now, we at Microsoft, um, we are very much committed... Sorry, guys, I'm getting some issues here. Can we just get the, uh, the last, yeah, the perfect, thanks guys. Um, so we at Microsoft, we're very much committed to, um, to driving that, that security protection for our customers. You know, we do sort of 43 trillion security signals that we analyze every day for intelligent threat protection um, and rapid responses. To give you an example of what that means in terms of results, 2.5 billion endpoint queries are blocked every single day across the world. 920 word, 921 password attacks are blocked every single second. So we're constantly looking at the threats that exist out there and we're continuing to invest in that space with a reported $20 billion in research and development over the next five years. So we're committed to making sure that our customers have the best possible protection available. Now, the key thing that drives part of this protection for our customers is devices. And unfortunately, older devices, they do put you at risk. If you, if you look at sort of some of the uh, feedback we've had again from some of the surveyed organizations, customers and security decision makers, 86% of them say that hardware leaves organizations more vulnerable to attack. 
87% have said they've had at least one firmware um, attack in the last two years. Now the solution to this, according to 80% of the people that we've surveyed, is that software alone is not enough protection against emerging threats. Modern hardware working inter, uh, interconnected and hand in hand with the software is really what the solution is for this, these, these uh, emerging and future threats. And this includes hardware-based protection like TPM chips and so forth, which we'll talk about further. Now the other key point is replacing old PCs and aging PCs with modern PCs is actually a lot easier um, than, than what we've seen in the past. Um, we're talking about you know, real advantages in terms of security, both in terms of you know, firmware attacks. So we've reported a 3.1 times reduction in firmware attacks with new devices. But then also from an, an ease of um, compatibility, so app compatibility, we're committed to making sure that applications are compatible across Windows 10 and Windows 11. We've seen to date a 99% compatibility rate. And then we have resources to help customers for customized applications that require that extra level of support as well. Now I want to talk a little bit more about the features and benefits of Windows 11. Um, but before we do that, let's, let's show a quick video to highlight some of those, so those features. So you've seen basically some of the, the highlights in terms of what Windows 11 brings to, to your organization. Now, reality is if you're ad adapting to hybrid work, you're upgrading your current devices, you're uh, simplifying your deployment, improving productivity, or ensuring business readiness, Windows 11 Pro is effectively our next step in the evolution of the PC. It's designed for modern devices. It includes tightly integrated hardware and software and a higher security baseline than Windows 10. Windows 11 has requirements built in and enabled by default, which is designed for what's required today in today's modern world. So why don't we talk about secure, the most secure Windows ever, which is what Windows 11 is. What do we really actually mean? Well, we're talking about sort of key things such as security out of the box and enabled by default. We're talking about ongoing protection against evolving threats. And we're talking about streamlined and modern security management. And obviously underpinning all of that are the business ready features that modern hybrid workers demand. So let's drill a little bit into each of these in a bit more detail. So firstly, when we talk about security out of the box, we're talking about features such as TPM 2.0, silicon assisted security. 
we're talking about built-in and enabled security to block software and uh, to block software and firmware attacks. We're talking about malware blocks at boot up. We're talking about replacing password with Windows Hello biometric authentication. And we're talking about stolen device protection with BitLocker encryption. Then when we talk about protection against evolving threats, this is talking about you know, ongoing th uh, threats evolving as you know, the threats get more sophisticated and evolve over time. And this is where we're talking about things like enhanced phishing protection with Microsoft Defender Smart Screen helping protect credentials, as you can see in the example. Passwordless authentication with Windows Hello, not only in terms of logging into the device, but then also in terms of accessing applications and websites and so forth. The other thing we're talking about is lock when you leave with presence sensing. So I'll give you an example, you know, you're using your device in a cafe, maybe in one of the airport lounges, and you, you walk away to go get a coffee or walk away to get some food and you've left the device unlocked, which is obviously insecure. This will now sense that you've moved away from the device and will auto lock. We're also talking about protection against untrusted sources by opening files and websites in isolated containers using Microsoft Defender Application Guard and also hardware specific features such as Secure Cord PC and Microsoft Pluton Silicon, which allows us to update these features over time through the Windows update process. But we're also talking about modern security management. And this is where we streamline security management across diverse locations and extend security all the way to the cloud, ultimately helping protect device, devices, data, applications, and identities everywhere and anywhere they're being used. So features such as um, real-time support through the cloud with remote help, Windows Update for Business to stay up to date with evolving threats easily, ensuring policy compliance for on-site and remote workers with Microsoft Intune, supporting zero-touch deployment and pre-configured devices using Windows Autopilot. This is obviously very important when you've got staff joining an organization where they're not coming into a physical office and they're joining remotely. And then also secure sign-on across all applications with Windows Hello, integrated with Azure Active Directory as well. But critical to the success of supporting hybrid workers is having the right business-ready tools to boost that productivity and collaboration that they need. And we've got some amazing new features that we've brought into Windows 11. Things such as snap layouts, which maximize screen space, and make multitasking much, much easier. We're talking about smarter video conferencing with intelligent noise cancellation, background blur, and the ability to share files instantly, unmute and mute from the taskbar. We're talking about more intuitive interface with centralized taskbar, personalized file explorer, and start menu app folders. Now, it's great to talk about these things, but what I'd really love to do is introduce our commercial master trainer, Ashley Perkins, to come on stage and actually demo some of these features. Ashley, why don't you join me on stage? Awesome. Thank you, Andy. I'll leave you to it, mate. So it's one thing to, to talk about different features, see them in a slide, that's great, that's fantastic. But what does that mean in terms of that real world usage of what employees are going through? There's a lot of things happening behind the scenes, but how does it translate into that user experience? So I've got a number of different devices here um, and all sort of set up in a way to be utilized based on a per user scenario. So you can, particularly when you're utilizing modern management and you'll hear about deployment later, how easy it is to roll out the right device for, for each employee. But let's start off from the very beginning um, when it comes to security. So when it comes to logging in, it goes, welcome back, Ash, we're ready for you. If the lighting is just right, here we go. Okay, let's, we'll try that again. Okay, it's having a little bit of space. Right, there we go. All right. 
Let's give that another go in another time. Let's, let's see how we go. But once we're logged in, theoretically, it sees your face, it looks at a pin, it looks at a fingerprint reader. So you can choose the biometric that works for you. Um, and you're presented with the Windows 11 interface. So with this, you'll see immediately that the taskbar is in the middle. Now, this is great for a wide range of different devices. So I'm lucky enough at home to have an ultra-wide display. So I've got you know, 49 inches of travel from each end. And that's a lot of mouse travel if it's in one corner. But because it's in the middle, it's, it's quick and easy for me to access. It's even great if I'm on a smaller device or even on a tablet device. That start menu is always in the same place for me. And so if we look across the bottom, we've got our, our widgets area, which also has some, you know, points out how humid it is today here in Sydney. And then as we move across, we have our redesign start menu. Our start menu here is about making access to the things that I'm going to be utilizing either now or, or in the short near future. Um, so I've got my pinned apps as well as recommended things. So things I've either just installed, things that I've edited recently and I've got events coming up that I can jump back into to reference, or even other items that another team member has been using and that we've been collaborating on. So it can alert me through here that, um, let's say, Andy has, has jumped into a deck and has added some comments. It will draw my attention through here, and I can jump into those files nice and easily. In our latest update, we've improved that search area. So not only for, for an organization, it's important to see who I've been working with recently. So that's in this top area here. These are the people that I'm frequently communicating with, whether it's through Teams or email. I can see my organization layout. And then through here, through the Microsoft 365 area, these are files that I've been working on or, again, been collaborating with others with um, through here. So I can not only just search for specific files, but I can see even more detail of things that might be relevant to me in my work, what I'm doing. As we move across, We've got our quick settings here. So not only can I see where my media controls, but I can also look at my quick settings. My quick settings, whether it's Wi-Fi connectivity, airplane mode if I'm about to jump on a plane and need to do some work, or I can even quickly access accessibility features through here. So unlike before, where you had to dive through an extra few settings to be able to enable things, it's all through this little area. And you can customize this list as well based on your needs. One particular one favorite of mine is live captions. So I can quickly enable it through here. I can jump up, visit, and let's say, hey, I'm finished presenting. I want to watch a little bit more about 365 Copilot, which we've, we've announced recently. And I can click play and actually have those captions appear at the top. So even if the platform that I'm using to watch that video doesn't support captions, the operating system is, to, is able to actually create those captions for me. So it's great not just for those who have hearing accessibility requirements, but also for different scenarios where captioning will actually be useful to me. So we close that. And whilst we're here, I'm going to show you a little bit around, and, and we'll revisit, we'll, we'll give it another go. So with what we've done with Windows Hello and how the operating system works closer with the hardware is how not only just I can use biometrics to log into the device, but I can also access resources. So if, uh, if I'm wanting to do a little bit of sneaky shopping, I can sign in and actually utilize Windows Hello. So if we can get the face one to work at the moment, the lighting is a little bit challenging. There we go. And I'm logged in. So I don't need to remember a password. It's safe for me. It wants me to verify because I've been signing in and out a lot from this device to make sure it works. Um, but so. Because Windows Hello is utilizing the latest FIDO security standards, this works across those websites that support those security standards. So it's not just about the biometrics on the device. It can translate through into the other services. The other one is, of course, using my device connected to the AD to actually access the Office side of things, SharePoint. Um, and so I can utilize those biometrics to go through those online resources as well, utilizing my, my uh, my bi biometrics. So when it comes to snapping, we've got our docking and undocking feature that uses and leverages this as well. So not only can I just arrange my windows based on my screen resolution, um, my let's let's bring this one up. 
not only based on my screen resolution, but also screen orientation. So if I'm using a device in portrait mode, it's going to give me options to arrange my windows in that format that works for me. Previously, we didn't have that. And for those who love vertical monitors or are using a tablet, that was a feature that they missed out on. And that's something that we brought through to Windows 11 to expand that that productivity potential that exists when you when you can arrange your windows like this. Um, and it's very simple, hover your mouse and access that, or even drag over to the top and then you can find that layout that works for you. And again, that responds to your screen resolution. So if you've got a nice high resolution 4K display, you can fit more applications, you can fit more information on there. So as you might have seen within, or something that we've introduced in our latest Moment 2 update to Windows 11 is integrating Bing closer into um, our Edge browser and the operating system as well. So I've got a little bit of an example here. So we've got Bing built into the right-hand side of here, and I can activate it through here. So let's, for example, I've, we've been looking at Microsoft 365 Copilot, the, the blog post that they've put out. Actually, I don't just want to ask a question. I actually just want to compose an email to Andy. And I said, hey, I just quickly want to write an email and say, um, write an email to Andy highlighting two features of this page and give an excuse as to why we should use it, it ASAP. So I can say, hey, look, it's not really a professional thing. I just want to make it casual, make it an email, make it nice and short, and I can actually generate that draft off that. So this is just the, the it's a great way to summarize information. If you're doing a little bit of research, you can create into ideas. You can look for a blog post. You can just create a paragraph about something if you need to summarize it and to add it into an email. And so it's, it's looked at that information, brought it in, and I can simply copy that tweak it, personalize it a little bit more to myself, and then send that on if I really wanted to. So it's a really cool thing, and it's just the tip of the iceberg of what we're able to do um, with having that, that Bing chat capability brought even closer into the operating system experience. So we've looked at the way that we can lay out Windows. We've looked at some of the accessibility features um, and, and also how we lay it out. So if we also look at, based off, if you've had a two-in-one device, Previously, you had to activate tablet mode as you brought that device into tablet mode. But simply now, as I rotate that device, you'll notice that the interface has actually made itself a little bit bigger for me. It's giving me more touch point for my finger because unlike a mouse, my fingers are a little bit bigger <laughs> and it's not as accurate. And so I can simply just bring up and now use gestures. So if I want to bring up the start menu, if I want to drag around and use my finger, I can easily now just arrange my windows exactly like that as I need. So it's a great way to just streamline again to take you out of or it reduces the possibility of taking it out of your creative flow and allows you to just focus on your work and what you're doing. And again, as I flip it back, it's back into a mouse-first interface. And finally, so as you might have seen, we, we also support the Amazon App Store and running Android apps on, on Windows 11. And we also have, as well, the subsystem for Linux. And now it's not just about running it in a, in a command line, like here, but also we have the ability to run things through uh, a GUI interface as well. So this is right here is the Edge Beta for Linux running a full GUI version on Windows. Um, so this is just an example of the possibilities of what you can have of running different environments on the one device if you need it. Um, and so I can even access you know, being through there as well. But finally, before, before we hand back to, to Andy and to the rest of the team, one last thing I did want to show you is that, so I'm, I've been sitting in a Teams meeting at the moment with me, myself, and I. And, um, and I simply just want to show you how easy it is to share things. I've talked to a lot of different customers and a lot of different partners of, it's, it's a concern of, particularly if you've got a million things open across three different displays, information everywhere, and you're sitting in a meeting and you want to share just one specific piece of information. It can be tricky if you're going through a share interface or if you're using different collaboration applications where the interface is different across all of them. So if I wanted to mute and unmute or share content, I can do this through the top part of the interface here. I can click share, select what I want to look at, but I can make it a little bit easier for myself. So one, I can hover my mouse over the interface at the bottom and just simply go, hey, look, I want to share this because I 
you know, I think everybody should look at how, how cool utilizing Bing Chat is. So I can share that specific, um, that specific window right there and have that only shared. And if I simply want to stop sharing, I can click stop sharing right there. It's super easy, super simple. But also if I'm playing around in maybe doing that shopping on eBay, and uh, let's say somebody calls out my name saying, hey, Ash, what do you think about this? Or what are your thoughts on this? I can simply just mute and unmute my, my microphone through the taskbar. So there's only one spot. I don't have to bring the meeting back up to the forefront. It's right there available for me to use. So that's everything for me. I think that's just a, a snapshot of what it is. If you haven't played with Windows 11 already, I highly recommend it um, and, and see some of these features for yourself. But I'll hand back to you, Andy. Great stuff, Ash. Thank you very much for that. That was fantastic. OK, so look, it's great to see some of these amazing features. Um, but you know, for us, Windows 11 is very much a continuous journey. And we are continuing to update Windows 11, not only from a security standpoint to stay up to date with the latest threats, but also from a feature standpoint to help hybrid workers continue to be more productive and more collaborative. So some of the new features we announced in the, in the recent update, enhanced phishing protection with Windows Defender Smart Screen, um, presence sensing adding to the security story that we, we talked about earlier, test base and app assure are enhanced for ease deployment to Windows 11. So that's one thing we continue to, to promote. Um, remote help, organizational messaging, aiding secure management, um, and then end user features such as the file explorer tabs, um, the focus tools and the captions to help keep employees productive. Now, the features are great, really fantastic. The operating system is designed for secure hybrid workers, but key to bringing Windows 11 and the features to life are modern devices, upgrading to new modern devices. You can only really reduce this risk from cyber attacks by replacing aging PCs with modern new device hardware. And the positive impacts of modern PCs go beyond just improved security. We're talking about improved productivity and collaboration. We're talking about low, lower total cost of ownership. We're talking about more customer satisfaction, as we've confirmed through our research. And modern, modern hardware has really improved in more ways than what we traditionally think. Not only is it just faster processor, better battery life, but we're talking about better connectivity with things like Wi-Fi 6, USB 4 with Thunderbolt. We're talking about you know, better Bluetooth connectivity. We're also talking about things like higher quality displays and higher quality audio visual webcams and so forth where people are using the devices uh, for, for more calls and, and video conferencing every day. Um, and obviously enhanced touch and pen integration, especially when you're able to now use Windows 11 in a more easy touch interface using you know, your finger as well. So, it's really about bringing more of those productivity f features to life with modern hardware as well. So folks, that, that's really what I want to share today around Windows 11 Pro. It is specifically designed for secure hybrid work. It very much meets the needs of our customers today and how they're going to be using devices moving forward. Now, you'll hear more today from our other presenters about Windows 11 security and deployment in a bit more detail but I encourage everyone to start to think about your deployment journey today. With less than three years to go until Windows 10 end of support, now's the time to really start thinking about Windows 11, start to trial it within your organization and, and work with our device partners to, to get that going. Now, before I hand back to Sammy, I'm gonna leave you with a video showcasing some of the exciting new AI-powered Bing updates we announced for Windows 11. Thanks very much, everyone.
Thank you, Andy and Ash. I, uh, I really do love those demos. I swear every time I see you do that, I learn something new that's going to make my tomorrow slightly easier. Um, so in our next session, you guys are going to hear from one of our customers who's now fully deployed on Windows 11. They're going to share a couple of their learnings and insights from the journey that they've been on that'll hopefully help you um, in the journey you're on and, and that you'll find valuable. Um, but first up, we want to start with a video that showcases the journey L'Oreal's been on the last couple of years. L'Oreal wants to be a beauty tech company that will change the future of beauty. We create experiences and services to our consumers, and we want to create the same experience for our employees. At L'Oreal, selecting Windows 11 was a no-brainer. For us, it's the foundation of everything we deliver. It's what connects the tools and creates that seamless connectivity between them. Our users are expecting more every day. In order to satisfy that, we are providing a full set of features thanks to Windows 11, like snap layouts, like the new star menu, the new search features, and of course, the seamless integration with Microsoft Edge. We are focusing always in productivity, collaboration, security and performance, because today we have users all around the world in different settings. They can be at home, they can be at the office or in a business trip, and we need to deliver a quality experience. The transition between uh, Windows 10 and Windows 11 was not disruptive, so it's really easy to use and really easy to discover all the features and to manage them, like the way to get the mic or share your screen very easily. I think it's really a positive impact and a positive way to evolve in the way that we are working with all our collaborators. Three years back, we had one image per country, sometimes one image per zone. Nobody was able to deploy the latest version of Windows in less than one year and an half. For us, Windows 11 was the enabler of the next step. Windows 11 gives us the opportunity to use the latest version and the more secure version of Windows. And it's really important for us because at L'Oréal, security is by design. At L'Oréal, we have more than 85,000 users. We knew that we had to deploy worldwide in different conditions. With Windows 11, we were able to do it in only four months. Thanks to Autopilot, thanks to Intune, we can do enrollment out of the office. That is a game changer for us. Windows 11 is having a huge and positive feedback in our employees. We are seeing a high level of adoption. The user are not only taking advantage of the futures, they are embracing it. Good morning, everyone. Uh, and if you are joining us from Aotearoa, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mitch Smith. I'm a modern endpoint specialist for Microsoft Australia New Zealand. Um, my pronouns are he and him. Uh, for the visually impaired, I am Caucasian with orange hair that is thinning, sadly, uh, and I'm wearing a blue shirt. Uh, my role in our organisation is to help customers benefit from modern technology, modern devices, things like Windows 11, help them migrate to Windows 11. Um, before I start, I'm actually going to tell a little personal story, if that's okay, if you'll indulge me. Ash was just um, showing quite a few features and demonstrations. Uh, one of them that is actually rings true with me, strangely enough, is some of the accessibility uh, features, specifically live captioning. I'm not hard of hearing. Uh, my wife would beg to differ, but I'm not hard of hearing. I, though, like Sammy, uh, get to live in regional New South Wales. I live in Barrel in the Southern Highlands. And that means that I'm on trains a fair bit. Um, there was an incident uh, a little while ago where I was joining a, a meeting. Uh, my headphones died, sadly, and I really wanted to participate in that meeting. Um, I didn't know what to do and then remembered live captions. And I turned that on. I got to participate in the meeting and have the entire carriage also not participate in the meeting. So it was actually a feature that I never thought I'd use, um, but uh, certainly works a treat. Um, with Windows 11, nearly every customer of ours in Australia and New Zealand has started testing it in some way, shape or form, and many have already standardised on it as a platform. Um, I've been trying to do a little bit of digging into the types of customers that are using Windows 11, and I can't actually find a trend. Uh, I'm, I'm seeing large organisations, mining, banking, 
Even public sector uh, customers have uh, already deployed Windows 11 in large numbers. And then right down to real estate agents, local manufacturers, uh, logistics companies, Windows 11 uh, in terms of a majority of platform is prevalent throughout a lot of our customer base. Um, today I'm joined by Brendan Cooper who is from McCulloch Robertson Lawyers, um, a law firm with people located all around Australia, although Brendan uh, is based in Brisbane. Um, and he's going to talk a little bit about the journey that they've gone through uh, around moving to Windows 11. But uh, maybe we'll start with Brendan. Mate, can you hear me? And would you like to introduce yourself, please? I can absolutely hear you. Excellent. Thank you, Mitch. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'd love to, and, and thank you for having me on, Mitch. Um, yeah, so my name is Brendan Cooper. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm, I'm a member of an I, uh, law firm. Uh, I'm IT support services uh, supervisor. Um, my pronouns are he and him. I'm wearing a, a navy blue shirt, navy pants, and I have on socks with turtles on them. <laughs> uh, our, our law firm is 97 years old. Uh, we're working our way towards 100 years. Um, we, we do service uh, all of Australia from our various offices, um, Brisbane, Sydney, Newcastle, Canberra and Melbourne. Um, yeah, we, we uh, just at the end of our migration and I took part in that uh, as a technical lead. Um, so I came at it from understanding the business from a support perspective, knowing how our users uh, use the, the hardware and the software that they do day to day. Awesome, thank you. And we can see you now, so that's really good. Um, good. <laughs> um, going back a couple of years, back to the beginning of the pandemic, what, what were the challenges that you faced in IT at that time? Yeah, certainly. Um, we had the unfortunate benefit of being prepared. Um, we, <laughs> with our head office in, in Brisbane, we went through uh, a 2011 flood. Um, so we knew the value back then of, of being able to work in a hybrid situation. Um, we weren't prepared then and we've been working ever since to, to get to the point where we could sustainably have a hybrid workforce and we had gotten just about all the way there right before the pandemic. So we had um, taken steps to move to a co-located data centre, we'd moved our our, um, our telephony and our, our collaboration platforms to cloud. Um, yeah, we'd, we'd made the steps to to ensure that we were able to work out of a building, uh, the, the firm is a people, not a place. Oh, fantastic. Um, uh, it w through that time, uh, were, were there any specific factors then that prompted you to take a look at Windows 11? Yeah, absolutely. So our, our fleet of um, hardware was um, quite old at that time, considering its lifespan. Um, and look, the, the applications that we were looking to tender with to ensure that we were innovating uh, throughout the firm with um, applications and software, um, as well as hardware, we, we knew that hardware had to be replaced to keep up to date and, and Windows 11 was the, the only option to ensure that we were at the, the latest security and, and feature rich standard. Awesome, great. Um, talk me through uh, the process that you went through in planning the migration. I know. I assume you just didn't switch, flick a switch, and everyone was on 11 uh, no, overnight. No. Talk, talk me through the planning. Yeah, certainly. So, so as mentioned, we've been like uh, had it at, at the back end of our mind for quite a while. Um, but the planning for this um, project in particular um, actually spanned over 10 different streams of the project, and Windows 11 and the applications and policies and everything was just one of those. Um, so, amazingly, Windows 11 was a small part in a larger project to, to do a whole heap of changes um, all at once. Um, we planned for 12 months and then the implementation of those plans happened just over the last three months. Um, so the, the planning went all the way from, from budget and procuring the laptops um, themselves um, all the way through to ensuring that we had the knowledge within our team and within our partners um, to be able to um, build our, our environment and, and keep it supported. Um, in particular, we, we ensured that myself and our systems engineer that, that built our SOE uh, went to the Managing Modern Desktops um, a Microsoft course to keep us up to, up to, um, to skill and make sure that our, our partners could assist us. You took on 10 projects at the same time, is that what you just said? Yeah, 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 we, we did a whole heap. Um, yeah, there was uh, a, a fair few things. And you still have a full head of hair, you bugger. Thank you, that's awesome. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, sorry, the thing's not working all of a sudden. 
There we go. Did you pilot Windows 11 with a subset of oh. customers? Talk me through that. Absolutely. So, so we have a, a, a very robust change management process. We, we stage everything that we implement small and large, and this was one of the larger ones. Um, but yeah, no, we, we stage out with um, our IT director. He likes to, to be the, the first person to get things, not to be the one of the latest, greatest thing, but he will find any issue. Um, and he uses, he's been in law for a very long time. So he uses um, laptops as our lawyers do, so he can find the things that, that need to be addressed. Um, we expand out to our IT team to make sure that the, the system is stable. And then we work towards um, our business support services, everyone that supports our, our practicing staff. And then finally to our, to our legal staff. And um, we certainly make sure that um, at each point we are finding issues, resolving them and, and moving on. It also helped us um, greatly with um, refining our, our training procedures as well to make sure that that was as concise and, and uh, useful as possible. Uh, did you uncover any challenges through that period? Were there, were there any unexpected um, problems? Yeah, look, we, we expected to have some amount of where's this button or, or what I used to be able to find this here. Um, but amazingly, and, and um, I, I wish uh, Ash would have been there for my, um, my presentation. We, we actually touched on a whole heap of similar things, but um, his was much more in depth. Um, <laughs> We, we got an opportunity to explain um, the things that might have been uh, slightly different, but the things that will improve productivity, um, which is what we're all about. Um, so there were definitely challenge, but challenges, but they have been offset by the, the user functionality of Windows 11, as well as the, the hardware and software, of course, being um, much more up to date. Um, we don't have the, the volume of, of support calls for but things crashing, for example, multitasking is so much better. Mm, so net positive, that's great. Well, you know, um, Ash is based in Brisbane, I'm sure for the price of a cup of coffee, he could come to you and do some stuff. <laughs> there you go, I, volunteer, I volunteered him for you. Yeah. Um, so uh, across your org now, where is Windows 11? What are you at as a percentage of deployment? We are very, very close to 100%. We're sitting at about 98 with five, uh, what we call strays. Um, these people are hard to get to, right. um, uh, getting laptops to them and then taking them through a virtual training um, um, to set them up uh, is, is on the cards, but we're looking to have that done in the next couple of weeks. Awesome. Um, when you were going through a process of migrating um, and you had a situation, obviously, where you would have had um, Windows 10 and Windows 11 devices uh, at, at the same time, did you experience any challenges or issues uh, managing both OSs at the same time? Sure. Look, we, we had the benefit of, of accelerating our rollout to just three months. Um, we started in, in January. We were hoping to get it as a Christmas present for everyone, but didn't quite make it. Um, but we, yeah, we, we started mid-January and, and are just about done. Um, so we have the benefit of not having a, a large period of time with the managing of, of both uh, operating systems. However, like, um, look, creating uh, policies that apply to each individual um, operating system was uh, took a bit of effort to manage, but um, I think the early decision to move our application deployments um, to not even try and um, uh, start to use those in Windows 11, but move straight to Intune and deploy using Intune, mm. uh, had that clear separation for our applications and managing those was, was quite smooth. Fantastic. Um, yeah. Apart from what you mentioned before about you know, net positive in your IT support, uh, are you seeing any other benefits from the migration, like you know, end user experience, security, anything like that? Absolutely, yeah. Um, no, certainly. Uh, in my role, I'm, I'm looking at the, the, the satisfaction of our users based on how they interact with the, the hardware and the software that we have. But they are absolutely positive um, to, to be able to introduce new features. The, the snap layouts for our our staff, um, we, we dock at our, our workstations and we have two monitors. Um, being able to undock, go to a meeting, um, run through that meeting, come back, dock in, and the windows come back up exactly where they were, everything like that. Um, the snap layouts, being able to move them around as you see fit. Um, and definitely from, like, I, I felt like I was talking back to myself when Ash was speaking. The, the, what used to be a whole heap of buttons in the tray in the bottom right for trying to find settings for Bluetooth, trying to direct someone to their Bluetooth settings was very difficult in the past. Um, 
intuitively knowing that the, that quick settings is there and knowing that you can get to your settings um, for audio, for, for collaboration, for everything like that is is really important to, to productivity. Yeah, and I guess when a lot of your team charge by the minute, uh, productivity and time wastage is, is of absolute uh, critical importance. Um, Absolutely. Are there any uh, new features? Is there anything that you're looking forward to on the horizon of, of deploying from Windows 11? Anything you've seen that you, you can't wait to get your hands on? Yeah, definitely. Look, I'm, I'm in IT, I'm keen to see uh, everything that's coming with AI and, and um, seeing Microsoft um, lead the way and that is, is really awesome to see. But from our user's perspective, um, the uh, sort of organisational messaging, uh, I saw that pop up very quickly. That that looks like a feature that we could absolutely use to to advise of, of an external website being down or something like that. We can keep our, our users um, up to date on on anything um, right there. I'm really keen to, to delve deeper into that. Awesome. Uh, well, Brendan, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, hopefully sunny Brisbane. Uh, it's not so sunny here today, but hopefully it's nice weather up there. But no, thank you so much for, uh, for giving us your time and, and, and sharing your story with the audience today. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mitch. Um, so earlier we heard from L'Oreal about their migration uh, of 85,000 users in just four months um, with security and end-to-end -end user experience top of mind. You've just heard from one of the many customers uh, who have moved uh, significant numbers, almost 100% of their fleet to Windows 11. I'd like to leave you now with a short video from the first customer to adopt Windows 11, us, Microsoft, um, Natalie Dares. Microsoft's CV CVP of Digital Explore Employee Experience will share insights into what we experienced as an organisation as we migrated 190,000 users in just five weeks. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Wangui McKelvey, General Manager of the Microsoft 365 business here at Microsoft. Today, I'm here with Natalie Dares, Corporate Vice President of Microsoft Digital Employee Experience. Hey, Natalie, thanks for joining me today. Thank you, Wangui. I'm really happy to be here to share how we imagine the employee experience at Microsoft uh, to support the hybrid workplace and the critical role that Windows 11 has played in that process. Windows 11 is designed specifically to empower hybrid work while keeping organizations and employees' data, content, and apps secure on any device. Now, Microsoft is an organization with over 275,000 employees and vendors and that's a massive scale to account for and to adapt to. Natalie, how do you even begin to think about ensuring each employee is not only equipped with the right tools and resources they need, but get the best possible experience from day one? Yeah, in Microsoft uh, Digital Employee Experience, our mission is to power, protect, and transform the employee experience at Microsoft, and then provide the blueprint for our customers and partners to follow. And employees are the backbone of any organization. So whether it's day one or year 20, every employee needs the right experience to be successful in their role. And so when an employee joins Microsoft, they receive a welcome kit and they unbox their PC and Windows is the first thing they interact with. And as you know, first impressions count as does every impression an employee has of how their organization equips and prepares them to succeed. And Windows 11 makes an amazing first impression. As a technology-driven company, we want our employees to see how we're on the leading edge of innovation, including becoming early adopters of our own products and services. What has Microsoft's approach been to Windows 11? As customer zero, we're the first to test drive all of the new products and services at Microsoft. And our learnings from this are critical to ensuring that whatever we put into the market delivers a great experience to customers and partners. And we're excited that moving to Windows 11 helped us achieve our goals for employee satisfaction. Shifting to Windows 11 was actually a breeze, and we upgraded 190,000 devices in only five weeks. We also saw low support call volume and positive feedback from employees about features and functionality and not product issues or reliability. I do want to acknowledge that we at Microsoft are really privileged to be part of a technology first company. But even so, there are steps that you can take to ensure a smooth rollout. What can other organizations learn from Microsoft's experience. 
At Microsoft, we've already moved to cloud-based management, uh, which makes upgrading to Windows 11 really easy to manage. Organizations should also know that Windows 11 is built on the same foundation as Windows 10. And so upgrading is easy, secure, and it's a stable experience that doesn't require investment in new tools or processes. From remote onboarding to virtual meetings, emails, and casual coffee chats, Windows 11 has become the secure platform that's foundational to our hybrid workplace strategy. What are your recommendations, Natalie, for organizations to continue as they learn to adapt to the evolving demands of hybrid work? To have success in the hybrid workplace um, requires strong alignment between your digital experience, uh, physical spaces, and organizational culture. And without investing equally in all three, your employees won't thrive in the world of hybrid work. Thanks again for joining me today, Natalie. It's been a real pleasure sharing our Windows 11 journey uh, with you today. We're so pleased to be customer zero for Windows. And I'm confident uh, that the hard work the team has done to test and validate the experience at Microsoft is going to pay off for our customers and partners. And even if you're not planning to upgrade soon, rest assured that when you are ready, your employees will benefit from all the great capabilities in Windows 11. Based on our experience, whenever you're ready, Windows 11 is ready for you. Thank you so much, Brendan, for sharing your experience at McCulloch Lawyers. I think there's a lot of learnings we can all take away from that um, and, and uh, use in our journey into Windows 11. Um, it's now time to learn more about Windows 11 from uh, specific to security and deployment. So I'd love to introduce Pratima Singh, one of our technical specialists, um, to take you through it. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Thank you for all who have joined us in person today and for all who have joined over the Times uh, leave, uh, live event. Uh, before we talk about the two main aspects of Windows 11, which is security and deployment, and glad I'm talking about security today, uh, I wanted to give a quick introduction about myself. I'm Pratima Singh. I have been with Microsoft for quite some time, around 14 years. I'm not that old, guys. Uh, but uh, I started with the role of security identity. For folks who remember Active Directory, I was a part of that team. And then eventually I took a couple of roles from the application infrastructure. And now we are a part of a team called as Cloud Endpoint Technical Specialist, where we work with our customer in the journey of modern management. Now modern could be from the identity perspective, could be the device perspective, and sometimes it's the hardware. And that's where Windows 11 comes into the picture. And I would really appreciate questions coming in. We have experts. Uh, available on the team's live event and questions from the team in the room appear available post event as well. So before we talk about security, uh, I was reading this digital defense report uh, that was released last year and some fascinating facts uh, under the section of devices and infrastructure. And I thought it would be good to start about why security and why we have done those investment with Windows 11 security around some of those claims. Now, the first claim uh, that I was reading was around the pattern of attacks. We are seeing attacks are more around the remote management system. And this is quite predictable because since the COVID has happened, the way of working has changed. It was remote, then it became hybrid, and now we call it dynamic because it's totally up to you how you want to work. And we are seeing just in the month of May 2022, we had around 100 million attacks, which was around five-fold increase from the previous year. The se second pattern of attacks that we saw was trying to uh, predict at the vulnerability of the device firmware. So once you do that, finding the way to enter the corporate network and then launch those devastating attacks. And the third one uh, that took my interest was around about 32% of the security firmware images that were analyzed we found around 10% of critical vulnerabilities. Now, what we see common in these surveys and these claims is the attacks, I think Andy was mentioning about password spray and all those, they have moved from those traditional attacks, I would say, to more on the operating system and firmware. And that's where Windows 11 comes into the picture. This is a very common slide and I'll 
I bet you would have seen this in different conversations with Microsoft, and sorry to repeat this, okay? You would have seen this in conversation with employee experience team, with end user computing team, but I thought it would make sense even in a conversation with security. Now, one of the common challenge that started with the pandemic hitting was, how do we retain talent, right? And for doing that, organizations started providing means to increase user productivity by providing them devices, making sure they have all the productivity aspects available, which created a lot of pressure on the security team on how to balance the security across all layers of those operating system. And that's where I wanted to introduce Windows 11, which is raising the bar of security. Now, Microsoft is continuously working on making sure the default security baselines of Windows experience are met for the customer. For that, the commitment that we have is to make Windows security simpler for our customers and deepened also. Now, with Windows 11, we offer chip security, cloud protection, security at every layer, right? Which helps our customers work through those new attack vectors that I was talking about now and forever. And with every release, release of Windows, we are committed to making Windows more secure. And that's where here we are with Windows 11, secured operating system ever. <coughs> now, the reason I have this slide is, when, whenever we do any conversation of security, zero trust makes a very important part. Now, before even I talk about Windows 11 security, a lot of organizations ask, how do you align that with zero trust principle, essential eight components? And that's where let's take a recap of what zero trust security model means. At a very high level, and I'm sure everyone knows, zero trust security model means every person has limited rights for a limited amount of time, right? Now, which we do that by making sure we verify explicitly. When I say verify explicitly across all data points, which could be the identity, the device location, the health of the device for every access without any exception. Now, once you have verified explicitly, you make sure the user is given the right access for the right amount of time. And the third one, use the continuous analytics that Microsoft can offer to drive that detection and improve the protection. That's at a very high level what zero trust is. Now, how do we align those zero trust principle with Windows 11 security, right? We know hardware protection and software protection alone could not do the job for the emerging threats that we have. And that's where with Windows 11, we are combining the security protection and hardware protection from chip to cloud, right? And we are emphasizing on the fact that operating system security is urgent. Now, a lot of organization, when we interact with them, they understand, okay, we know device firmware attacks, operating system security, all that is very important, but it is complex. To make sure we have the right tools enabled, right feature enabled, it is very complex. And that's where, with Windows 11, we have made sure we have built in security and not bolted on which makes very easier for customers and organization to deploy and manage them in a very simple and efficient manner, right? Now, once customers have access to those zero trust principle, which they could never have if the deployment was made for the customer to uncheck and check those. So built in, bolted on is something that we need to remember within those level, right? <coughs> Second that you see is, hardware-based isolation security, which starts at the chip. And I think I, I was hearing, I think it was Andy talking about, and I think Ash trying a couple of times the Windows Hello uh, demo. So with hardware-based isolation, we offer the IT admin capabilities to make sure the authentication and authorization protocols are available to them. And one of the example is Windows Hello for Business. Show of hand, how many of have Windows Hello enabled? Good. <laughs> I was doing this event last time and I had just couple, so I was a little scared. So uh, now what we have done and why I'm talking about that, someone would be asking, okay, it was there in Windows 10. What's new with Windows 11 is the investment that we are making to make sure the deployment of Windows Hello for Business is easier for our customers. 
Now, just going a bit technical, we had different models to implement Windows Hello for business. We had key trust, certificate trust, creation of public key infrastructure, having domain controllers, syncing the keys, and customer was like, hey, we are okay with passwords, right? And with Windows Hello for Business Cloud Trust model, we are trying to eliminate those needs. You want to uh, implement Windows Hello for Business, you don't need a PKI. You don't need to work with syncing the password. Use the modern way of doing it. Use Azure AD Kerberos, right? And that's the path we are taking. And that's where we say modernize the hardware, modernize the way you're implementing everything. Not just hardware, with uh, Windows hardware-based isolation starting at chip, we also offer application security for application vendors or developers that we have, right? So for key features like application controls and isolation, code integrity, privacy controls, least privilege access, we allow the developers to have tools to inbuilt security from down up. So they don't need something to create those security available. One example is the Windows Defender application guard, which I think we had a demo shown on which basically uses virtualization, Hyper-B virtualization technology to isolate untrusted web websites, office files from access to the operating system and application, right? Making it very hard for the attacker to exploit any applications that you have, right? We have a lot of controls around what processes and feature have access to device information, like are very important. I work for FSI customers around what application and features on Windows can have access to information like device location, camera, microphone. So we have those controls, right? So whenever I show this deck, they're like, oh my god, you're going to talk about all of these? No. I'm just, I'm just going to focus on some of the aspect of how we differ from Windows security. This is available for decades from for Windows operating system. Uh, but as I said, hardware and software security protection was not enough for the emerging threats. And that's where we combined them and created security from chip to the cloud. And with this combined protection, what we did, we offered tools to the customer to make sure they are secure ever for the emerging threat in the way they are working now and in the future. So this slide deck talk about those controls, starting with the chip to the cloud. There would be some features that you would be using right now. And as, it, as I said, with Windows 11, most of them are built in. So you don't need to go through places to make sure they are enabled. They are enabled by default. And that's where the importance of modern hardware plays into the picture, because they come with these features enabled. Now, starting with the bottom, I'll just capture a couple of them, it's the hardware root of trust. right? So hardware root of trust at a very high level makes sure the integrity of the operating system is maintained when you basically start up or boot up your device. And how does it do that? It makes sure that any boot software that is getting loaded is basically verified by the vendor. right? So. Hardware root of trust works for various security controls. One of the examples that I can have is secure boot, which is enabled by default with Windows 11, is providing the environment to have a boot up which is secure. So what happens is, with secure boot, it confirms that every boot software is confirmed by the OEM vendor that it's signed properly. So I start up my machine, uh, the machine is booted up, the firmware launches, it confirms that, it makes sure drivers like UFE drivers, uh, UFI drivers, operating system, and all those are signed uh, by the vendor. And if the signature is confirmed, it makes the firmware loaded, which gives a call to the operating system, hey, you can load fine, right? We have capability like rollback protection, which makes sure that anyone cannot reverse the firmware version, and it's at the most secure place ever, right? Uh, <clears throat> we offer a lot of uh, aspects uh, around uh, TPM. You would be hearing a lot of uh, talks about TPM. Uh, so technologies like Windows Hello, BitLocker, uh, Windows Defender's Credential Guard, they use trusted platform module to store important keys. 
And TPM does a lot of job. It does key generation, encryption, storage of keys, attestation of those keys, signing of those keys. So it plays a very important role. And the reason why we have made TPM 2.0 by default and mandatory for Windows 11 is because the 2.0 in the TPM is the updated encryptions that we have with TPM, which means higher protection against user identity theft. And with Windows 11, you will have VBS, Secure Boot, TPM 2.0. These are the security capabilities enabled by default. Now, <clears throat> one, one more technology that I wanted to talk about since I'm talking about user identity is uh, LSA, Local Secure Authority. Coming from the Active Directory world, this is the process which is responsible for authorizing Windows login. The way we log in right now, if you don't have Windows Hello for Business username and password, it verifies that there is no unsigned code that is booted up in the LSA and everything is fine and it secures your user identity. With Windows 11, we have LSA protection enabled by default. So nothing would be launched in the LSA which is not signed by the OEM vendor or something like that. So these are the couple of technologies that we have, but if I try to go up at the top, and which would be something that my colleague in the deployment section would be talking about is the management. Right, you're giving us security, but are you giving us the way to manage that? Right now we are using XYZ tools to do that. Now with Windows 11, we have a great integration with Microsoft Intune. We have a great integration with Azure Active Directory. You saw Ash doing Windows Hello. What if, if you want to do a multiple factor authentication? You have all that enabled by default and you have tools like Intune and Azure Active Directory to do that. Now, since I have the forum, I also thought of talking about uh, a recent annou announcement. I see Mitch smiling there. A uh, re uh, recent announcement around Microsoft Intune. Has anyone have heard about that In Intune suite that we did on March 1st? No. So this was uh, an announcement that we did because we saw customers using separate security tools wherein they thought Intune was not helping them enough, and secure management tools like remote help that we saw was not helping them in remote assistance. And with the announcement of that, we are trying to get security capabilities and management capabilities just in one single console of Microsoft Intune. And just around the security aspect, we have something that is really releasing, it's in public preview right now, is endpoint privilege management, which is basically making available IT admin the option to create policies to drive how users' rights could be elevated when they are trying to access application for just in time. So it's policy driven, you create policy on Intune, it will tell you if you're accessing XYZ application, user has to get a prompt, he has to do an MFA or Windows authentication, and for just that enough of time, user will be able to access or launch that application. So this is the whole stack of security investment that we have done with Windows 11, and we are working on that evolution. And most of these capabilities will be first launched on Windows 11 and then backported on Windows 10 till 2025, right? And that's where I just wanted to talk about TPM, right? Now, I did talk about TPM 2.0 and hardware-based isolation and hardware root of trust. Uh, what you see on this slide is Trusted platform module is the core of the security of an operating system. It does a lot of job that it's responsible for. User identity, storage of keys, key generation, tools like Windows, Hello, BitLocker uses this particular chip. It's basically a hardware component, which as of now sits away from the CPU, right? And knowing the importance of TPM that we are just talking about and we are saying that TPM 2.2, Knowing the very importance of TPM, we are seeing attackers trying to find ways to compromise TPM and then physically steal the operating system. And the way they are doing that is by trying to receive the messages that TPM and CPU tries to share with each other, which is the communication bus that you see. So any conversation between the TPM and the CPU happens over this bus interface. And this is where they're trying to compromise, tamper those messages in transit. And our innovation to make sure that we can build something that we can stop is Pluton processor. 
wherein we are building the security processor inside of the CPU, and hence eliminating that bus interface wherein the attacks can happen, and trying to provide you that platform which is more protected for user identity. So Microsoft Blue Dawn processor is an investment that Microsoft is doing in partnership with Silicon Partners. And for Windows 11, with Microsoft uh, Pluton processor and technology like, like secured core PCs uh, and Hyper-V technology that I mentioned and hardware root of trust, we will provide you that unified model to protect against any user identity theft. Now one thing, just before I move on to the next slide about Pluton processor is one of the biggest advantage that it has. Now most of the organization, when they update their security firmware, they have sources from different, different angles. And that makes them very difficult if there is any kind of compromise to have that alert, which will make the system into a vulnerable state. With Pluton processor, it leverages Windows Update Service, which most of the organization are currently using to manage and maintain their endpoints. And hence, it becomes really easy for them to update Pluton processor as well. Now, one of the three key aspects of Windows 11, and you would have seen this multiple lot of time, is security, productivity, and user experience. Now, when we have conversations with customers around why Windows 11 and how Windows 11 will solve the security challenges, the next question comes, OK, we are fine, we are ready, let's start deploying, is to provide the strategy of how we can ease their deployment model what are the tools that are available for them to do that? And having that pilot group, as Brendan was talking about, targeting that pilot group, wherein we can showcase all the tools, technology, capabilities, and user experience becomes very important. And that's where I would will, I will like to invite Lou, who will talk about how Windows 11 update, I'm not saying upgrade, update process is much simpler, and how we are doing that, and what are the tools available. And before that, I'll just keep this slide which will be a good segue for Lou to talk about what are the minimum requirements for a Windows 11 upgrade. Thank you, sir. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Lou. Um, nice to meet you all today. So I'm a cloud endpoint technical specialist. And like Pratima, we, um, we focus on things like modern management, Windows 365, and, and Windows 11. Um, so a little bit about me. Oh, my slide, yeah. A little bit about me. Um, so my background has been very much in deployment. Uh, so I've done lots and lots of deployment work and very much a big focus on things like uh, Intune and ACCM. So when we see customers look at sort of moving and adopting a, a new operating system, what we're seeing is that that process is some, sometimes taking you know, three to five years on average. And hopefully with what I sort of tell you today, uh, it's not uh, the case for you with, with sort of the new um, work that we've done around um, this new servicing models, which is actually not so, so new. It's, it's what you've already been doing with Windows 10. But what I'm showing you on the screen at the moment is really a roadmap to modernizing your, your endpoints. Now, a lot of on the screen is things that you, you've, you might be doing today, things that you've already been investing in um, as you've been uh, using Windows 10. And I won't talk about all of them, but I just wanted to sort of highlight, you don't actually need to do any of this to deploy Windows 11. But a lot of this will actually help you um, with getting to uh, Windows 11, but it'll also help you with the experience once you're there. So it all sort of starts off with, with identity. So having a, a cloud identity is, is important, so important to accomplish a lot of the security and um, the ability to support the way that we work today in a, in a hybrid world. And conditional access p plays a very core part to that. But things like uh, under cloud files and services, things like OneDrive. So having OneDrive and, and known folder um, redirection and uh, files, files on demand will help you with your users moving to new operating systems. So taking that user data away from the equation makes actually switching quite easy. Um, but not just switching to Windows 11, but also when they get a new, new piece of hardware, you know, throughout their lifetime, users get, get, get new hardware for whatever reason you need to rebuild that. But that's just one part of the equation that's now simplified. And um, we talked about modern devices, modern devices to meet the modern world um, and leveraging the security elements that's in there that uh, Patima took us through. Um, but also about device management. So as you look to deploy Windows 11, 
it's a great opportunity to modernize. So modernize on how we are um, 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 managing the devices. So things like autopilot, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later, um, leveraging uh, endpoint analytics, looking at how we service the devices. So um, I've got uh, auto patch there, which I'll talk about a little bit later as well. Um, but also with regards to security, looking at well, how are we approaching security um, for this new OS and you know, focusing on things like, for example, how many agents do we have running on our operating system? Because the more agents we have actually slows down the machine. But not just slowing down the machine, it consumes battery. So looking at ways to, to better improve efficiency and, and of course user experience is important. And I've got virtualized endpoints at the bottom. So there's three ways to experience Windows 11 on a physical device, on Azure Virtual Desktop, and on Windows 365. Windows 365 really being that SaaS-based approach, um, which I'll have to talk about. But so come talk to me later about it afterwards. Happy to do that. So when we talk about the life cycle of Windows 10 and Windows 11, there's some, some few differences. So we went from having two releases per year. And with Windows 11, we'll go to one release per year. But with that new sort of um, um, adoption um, and release cycle, we're extending the amount of supportability that we have. So for Home and Pro, we have 18 months currently. We're going to shift to 24 months. For the Enterprise, so the H2 release, we have 30 months currently for Windows 10. With Windows 11, that will be 36 months. But probably something really important in the slide, and it's in the small writing at the bottom there, is that formal support for Windows 10 ends in October the 14th, 2025. So you've got a couple of, just over a couple of years to start planning. So how do you actually get to Windows 11? So really simplified way, um, that I've overly simplified, but two main ways. One is that you do an upgrade, and I'll focus a lot of my uh, remaining discussion on, on the upgrade process. Uh, and two is that you purchase a new piece of hardware with um, Windows 11. Now what we see with, with a lot of customers when they buy uh, hardware today is that they're actually choosing to downgrade that to Windows 10. And I really encourage you to not do that, and hopefully you'll see, see why. And we'll talk about coexistence a little bit as well. OK, so in planning for deployment, I like to sort of split it up into these four tiers as such, or four pillars. So starting with hardware eligibility. So with that October 14th date in mind, how do I know which hardware my state will be ready for Windows 11? Because you know, the, there's, a, there's a different set of requirements. Um, but how can I do that with, with the tools uh, that's there? And if you're looking at the management tools, well, of the management tools that I'm using today, what will support Windows 11? What can I use to deploy Windows 11 with? And if I'm using anything else other than, say, Intune or ACCM, who are those third-party vendors that I need to reach out to and discuss and have a chat about? But also on the management tools, are my support staff ready to handle the queries that are going to come through with Windows 11? Is there any sort of documentation that I need to update? What do I need to do to enable them to support it within the org? And then looking at application readiness. Application readiness in sort of with previous versions of, of, of the operating system has been an area with great focus. And um, you know, it has its own tier here. But a big question is, will my apps work with Windows 11? And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. And then planning for, for coexistence. So as we look to deploy Windows 10 and Windows 11, what does it look like to have them running side by side? And no doubt you will be having, you know, that might be a short period of time, but you might be having them running uh, alongside to each other. So what does that look like? And what do I need to do to enable my employees to use Windows 11? Because as you've seen, there's some new things in Windows 11. Um, whilst the, the experience is somewhat similar, the UI has changed. And there's some new features in there that's really going to help my employees with, with things like productivity. OK, so back to that first tier of hardware eligibility. Um, just a quick show of hands, who here is using endpoint analytics with an Intune? Or oh, we've heard of it. Yeah, OK. <laughs> All right, so with an Intune, uh, under um, uh, endpoint analytics, we have this great new report called the Work From Anywhere report. And it says preview, but it's not in preview anymore. It's, it's been released. And under the Windows tab, you see them. It's going to go ahead and list all the devices that you have that's either co-managed or enrolled with an Intune. And it will tell us which devices are upgraded to Windows 11, which are capable, 
and which are not. Now, of the ones that are not, you can see a couple of examples there. It's also going to tell us why. So things like the CPU family, or it could be as simple as the system firmware in which and potentially it could be an upgrade and that can then switch to, to being, being capable. But this is a quick and easy report that you can export. And again, with that date in mind of, of October 2025, start to plan out which devices in the next couple of years that I need to, to look at refreshing. So moving over to that next tier of uh, management tools. So the good thing is that if you're using Intune today, there's nothing you need to do for Windows 11 support for Intune. It's, it's just ready to go. If you're using SCCM, um, again, good opportunity to think about potentially modernizing with what you do there. If you are using SCCM, you want to make sure that you're on at least 2107. Um, that will, will make you ready for, for Windows 11. If you're doing deployment and you're utilizing things like task sequences, for example, we have the latest tool, toolkits, the ADKs, all ready to deploy Windows 11. So that's simply there for you to, to update and, and, and go for it. And if you're doing things like Active Directory and so forth, nothing really you need to do. It's just all ready to go with Windows 11. But again, you know, look at these opportunities to modernize. So if you're not in a co-managed state with SCCM today, um, it's fairly easy to turn on. And you have the, the, the ability to choose your workloads that you want to switch over. Um, have a look at that and, and see if that's actually going to help you with, you know, again, leveraging that endpoint analytics. Turning on that, that co-management will give you that reporting quite easily. OK, application readiness. So the important thing to note about Windows 10 and 11 is that they share the same code base. So most likely if an app that you have running on Windows 10 is most likely going to work on Windows 11. And what we're seeing with you know, testing over 800,000 apps, we've got a 99.6% application compatibility rate. For everything else, uh, we have a team called the AppAssure team. And they are there really to help you with application compatibility issues. Um, and so far to date, there's been, in, you know, they've, they've looked at over about 3,000 odd apps that needed a bit of work. And that's allowed over 90 million endpoints to get unblocked to, to adopt um, Windows 11. Now, the AppAssure team is available to any customer that has M365 licenses. As long as you've got over about 150, um, they're, they're, they're there to help you. On top of that, we have something called TestBase. So TestBase is an Azure-based computing environment that's really geared for you to be able to um, you know, use and test and validate your apps to see, you know, are they going to run? And that environment is there to, to actually help you assess that. So planning for coexistence. Now back in 2015, when we introduced Windows 10, we also introduced this new servicing model. Uh, so the Windows servicing model that you are now uh, somewhat used to. So this consistent cadence of updates being released. Uh, and with you know, consistency uh, in mind, the guidance is to treat Windows 11 exactly how you treat a feature update. So the same tools, the same appli uh, applications that you use, the same processes, the same strategy that you've been doing today is going to be the consistent way to deploy Windows 11. And treat it like another feature update. Deploy it alongside. And touching on Windows Autopilot. So uh, quick show of hands. Are you guys, anyone using a Windows Autopilot today? OK. So Windows Autopilot, I mean, if I were to talk about Nirvana when it comes to deployment, Nirvana is purchasing a device and sending it straight to the end user. The end user just logs on with their corporate identity, and IT never has to touch it. So that's Nirvana, and essentially that is exactly what Autopilot is. And how this works is that you purchase a device, and you have the vendor, whoever you're purchasing it from, register that device against your organization. So that device, before it even leaves the warehouse, should know who it belongs to. So when the user receives it, they log on. And because that association is there, that device will check into Intune and say, here's the policies that IT has previously created for me. Here are the apps that need to come down. And it's able to do that as the users are logging in. So what this means is that the whole deployment process is really simplified. So you move away from managing task sequences, which is a real pain. And it's really complex. It's time consuming. You move away from managing images 
you move away to, from making sure those images are distributed to the right places and you're moving away from pes pressing that pesky F12 button and doing pixie boot. It just makes the whole thing just simplified. Your IT people love it because it means that they don't have to deal with that anymore. Uh, the end users love it because it means that they're able to get working faster. Um, and it, it, that sort of little gap where, you know, typically, and, uh, and this has happened to me before, you started a new job, the hardware is not there, or IT is still building it, you've got a temporary device. There's always sometimes a bit of lag where hopefully this can reduce that time to productivity. And I wanted to touch base on AutoPatch. So AutoPatch um, is a new service um, that is really designed around saying, well, let us do your patching for you. And I like the description in the box there. It's a service that automates the process of managing and rolling out updates to Windows, Microsoft 365, uh, to improve security and productivity across the organization. So what we're really saying is that, let us do the, the, the patching for you. And what we, we do is that we use, or we, we look into your Intune, and we start to create the deployment rings. So we do that for you. And we start to create the policies around that to start to actually de to deploy updates. Now, you are probably doing the top half today. So the top half being, so if you focus on that little blue, blue box. So what do you do today is that you know, we release an update. But when that update comes to you, you are testing that update. Is it socially going to work with my SOE today? Um, you are evaluating that to make sure that nothing breaks. You are creating those, those deployment rings. And then as those testing phases between those rings happen, you are promoting it yourself and, and monitoring how that update works. With Autopilot, we move to the bottom. So all you have to do is enroll the devices. And essentially, you're simply adding it to a group effectively. Um, and we do the rest. So we release the update. We create the deployment rings for you. We, we use automation and AI to populate those rings to make sure that there's a good cross-section of new devices represented in each one of those rings. And we start to deploy the updates. Now, you might say, well, actually, I'm doing this today. It's all automated. There's, there's little that I need to do. It just works. Now, the difference between you doing it and us doing it is that the people who do this is the Windows Update team. So they're the experts. And I like to use the analogy of a car. So you buy this brand new car, you can take it down to the local mechanic and sure they might do a good job, or you can take it to the dealer, so the dealer who made the car. The difference being is that the dealer has this intimate knowledge of the vehicle. They know the bits and pieces that were recalled, they know uh, all, the, all the, the stuff there that is just simply harder for anyone else to do. Now what we do differently, and is again also very different from, from anyone else, is that monitoring aspect. So when we deploy an update, we take a snapshot of the device beforehand. And when I say snapshot, it's around metrics. So how is the, 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 the machine performing? What is the boot up time? Post the update, we look at the metrics again. Has there been a slowdown? Has there been crashes? How many devices is this affecting? And what we might do is that we might halt the update before it progresses to the next ring. We might roll it back. Or if there's a particular issue with this, maybe a small component of that update, without pulling back that whole update, maybe just roll the rest of it and maybe just stop that small component. But what it means is that we are making sure that we roll out the security updates as soon as possible, and we make sure that nothing, or, or minimizing anything that breaks. And if you do experience app compatibility issue, within Windows Auto Patch, the App Assure team is integrated. So, Anything with regards to app comp compatibility, you're able to raise tickets, and we, we will help you. Now, you know, I'm talking about Windows 11. Why am I bringing up Auto Patch? Well, patching is part of it, opportunity modernize. But you can also test the deployment of Windows 11 with Auto Patch. So it will help you get to different versions of Windows 10, but it will also help you with um, testing out Windows 11 as well. All right, so just to summarize, um, when you are planning um, sort of your deployment and, and sort of how, how to succeed, understanding your hardware requirements becomes important. Um, that endpoint analytics report that I showed you is, is fantastic. A quick way to look at, well, what's going to support Windows 11 and what's not. Understand the new security features, and Pratima gave us a fantastic overview. But also understand when we do a deployment, an in-place upgrade, and what the security features get, that get turned on 
may be different from when we do a fresh build of Windows 11. So just understand the differences there and how that aligns to your security posture. Engage Fast Track. So Fast Track are there to help you, help you to adopt Windows 11, and App Assure to help you with anything app compatibility uh, related. And very important is have a communication plan, have a change management and adoption plan as well. And that little link, which uh, we'll make available to you later at the bottom, um, has some great documentation that you can send to your end users that will help you with some of those comms. If you have any questions, um, please come find us later. But uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Lou and Pradama. Uh, it's now time to say goodbye to our virtual audience. So thank you so much for joining us today. Before we let you go, though, we're going to leave you with one final video. And um, in my personal opinion, this is the most exciting innovation that our modern work stack has seen in some time. Um, so introducing Microsoft Autopilot. Thank you.